I worked for I worked for a stock broker which was based out of Detroit called Oldie, Oldie Discount, and you know they were one of the original discount companies, but they were they actually bought a building to house us when we went up there, and so we were like downtown downtown, and we used to always say like Toronto you know, wins, <coughs> Toronto won the championship. So for the first time ever, the Canadians who a Canadian no wait a minute, they're stopping at zero, they're stopping at a zero. What they call it a foul? They're calling. Well, people in Toronto are losing their shit, though. Didn't I mean? It looks like Toronto just got another point somehow, right? They're one twelve. Yeah, they got a twelve. They got a. They got a point. It was a. It was a technical foul. Oh, okay. I, I don't have. I don't have the sound up because I, I can't hear anything that's going on in the game. So I'm kind of just watching. And it looked like it was a. It was some kind of a situation. Where there was a ball on the on the court. They gave. They gave Toronto a, a technical foul, or they, they gave them the, the, the shot and the ball back with point nine seconds left. Wow. And they, and they found the ball, and it looks like, I don't know what they're calling right now. There's some kind of dispute because well, it looks they're, like they're, Kawhi Leonard made they, a basket. They have to talk about the, the time thing because there's that, there's that rule that says, like, you cannot make a shot unless you have at least .9 seconds on the clock. Like, like they have to literally throw the ball up and tip it in if, if there really is zero seconds on the clock. Yeah, I don't understand <laughs> what's going on. I, just, I, can't, I can't hear anything that's happening. Well, turn it up. But it's interesting. It's interesting nonetheless. I mean, it's it's more interesting than us. No, we're 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 good <laughs> as far as it goes. I was going to talk about like some of the like we talked about how Mike Bustakis has been really hot, you know, sure. lately. And so, like looking at just guys, like he's been hitting three seventy since June started. The, there's a couple guys in here that are like that have been hitting very well since June that I think are worth mentioning. Like we're not really shocked that Kristen Yelich is on this. Corey, you know, it's out of control. Corey Seager's on this list, of course. He's done for a while. But what do you think about these names? Like, I think one that really should come up is Brian Dozier. He's been hitting 387 since the start of June. Brian Dozier. I was I was going to talk about him on Monday, but I didn't get a chance to come and talk about him. He has been on fire. And it was ever since pretty much Carter Kyboom got sent up and, and demoted. Like, like, it was during that whole situation. And he went off ever since. Yeah, he's been playing out of this world. He's got, he's, he, you know, he, I, I picked him up in one league in my smaller league because he's just there. But he's sort of hidden because if you're in a ten or twelve team league, you're still looking at his batting average. It's like two hundred nine. But like for the last month, he's been like, hitting like three sixty or three fifty, something ridiculous like that. And and, and 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 there probably isn't another player known in in baseball to be as to be able to put together such a dominant streak than that guy. That's a guy people should be picking up left and right. That's all I'm saying. That's a guy that kind of got screwed too. That I thought was due for a big contract after he hit like the the 38 homers or whatever it was two years ago, and then he just kind of fell off last year. Got traded at the, the trade deadline, and has you know he's been injured. But you know I'd like to. It yeah, would be nice no, he, he, you know, he did. The Nationals signed him for a, for a song in the off season, but it'd be nice to see him put together a nice season and maybe get a two or three year deal out had, of it and, and get had, some money that he that I believe had, he's due. Had Dozier not gotten traded, he would have he would have put up some pretty nice numbers for the Twins. What he got? Traded I, I don't think so. He was he was injured that year. No, what he got traded to the Dodgers. The biggest problem was they just didn't play him every day. So even if yep. even if he was playing well, the numbers got diluted enough that it pulled him out of the thing. Whereas if he had stayed in, you know, if he had stayed in, uh, if he had stayed in Minnesota, you know, they were playing Logan Forsythe the rest of the way, even with absolutely no commitment to him. He would have played. He would now have, it's over. One thirteen. They got another point. One fourteen to one ten. They got two points. They they called a foul on that last play, and Kawhi Leonard shot two free throws. Oh, Canada, so, glorious! And yeah, and they go. They got it done, man. That's cool. Congratulations to the Raptors, man. Uh, it's it's good. It's it's good for parity for the NBA. Now I don't have to listen to everyone complain about the Warriors are unbeatable. Blah blah. No, let them no. sign Durant. Let, let them resign Durant. You know what I mean? So no, I mean it'll be it, interesting to see what Anthony Davis does this off season. There's, there's a lot of cool things in the NBA. Like I said, the, the baseball could really take a page from the NBA's book with what they're doing. Well, I mean, I I, I did not like the idea of the super teams, but outside of that, I like everything NBA does because I, I don't like I, I don't mind the idea of the super team. I mean, we, we're already kind of seeing it now in the way that the Dodgers are being put together and the Red Sox are being put together, and especially the, you know the, these big market teams with no salary cap in MLB are able to put together these super team well, rosters. Now you don't necessarily have the players on social media being like, "Yo, bro, let's meet up and let's go make the super well, team." I mean, you just kind of have GMs putting them together. I, I don't think there's really a like a team that is like just made up of like superstar free agents, and that's where the thing you know comes in. Like you know, 
When, when I mean, LeBron... we, we saw we saw San Diego try to do it a few years ago yeah, and kind of blew up in their it, face. You know, yeah, we, we've seen teams try it, but we haven't seen it really, really work. I mean, historically, the Yankees were the the first guys to do it, and you know, we're talking like seventies, eighties when you know they brought in like Reggie Jackson, George Steinbrenner were... years, man, and he definitely did it. He he put together some teams there, but it, but like the, say what you will about the Red Sox and even the Yankees and the Cubs, like most of those guys are, are, are their own homegrown guys. They it's really like, are. They, they, it's it's like been a you, trend you, in baseball. You, last, you, you, know, you, you, bring in, you bring in one or two guys from the outside. You know, the Cubs bring in Lester, which is a big deal. You know, the Astros bringing in Brantley really kind of gives some, makes that lineup really rough. You know? You so can, in, we kinda, can we kind of arc back to the beginning of our show? Sure. So we were talking a little bit about dynasty, and this is this is right at that alley about how you build a dynasty team. And I, I've always mimicked that model of Major League Baseball to where I'll sell out everything. And you know, especially I don't know, have you guys played contract dynasties before? I know a lot of the people on this network just play standard, you know, I, I, draft I, I, dynasties. I, I, I don't play. I've, I've played contract dynasties, and, and that becomes... I played contract dynasty for roughly ten years, and yeah. uh, I won three championships in a ten-year period in the same league. Uh, I mean, one of them was in 2008, and then I won back to back in like 12 how, and 13. How, how did you? How did it like? If, if you signed a guy to like, you like you, had, you looked at a year that Jose Ramirez had last year, and at the end of the year sure. you decided you decided um, I'm going to sign him to a four year, twenty million dollar a year deal. Okay, so and for then, example, here, all of a sudden he sucks, and you want to get rid of him. Does it prevent you? Like you're screwed for four years. That contractors are they're kind of hard to move, so it just becomes like Major League Baseball, where you know, say for example, you got a, let, let's use that exact situation you just said. Let's say Jose Ramirez. So for example, in these leagues, you'll get what's called a franchise tag. So in the franchise tag, uh, the league defines the sets. Okay, so if you offer a player a franchise tag, he's guaranteed to get X contract, which is you know twenty million dollars a season, and you can you can structure it between one and five years. So you 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 offer the contract based on however you want to do it, or if he has a real life contract, you can choose to take that. It's one of two ways. There's also restricted offers where you can restrict a player and he goes through restricted free agency and the whole league gets to bid on him, etc. So let's just say you signed Ramirez last season. You, you took a $20 million four-year deal on him and you're having a lot of problem moving him this offseason. You may have to turn around and include your top prospect or your number one pick in the draft this next year to be able to offload that money to a team who a believes in him and B has the, the, the cap room to wiggle him in there. And it becomes very interesting. And I'm telling you, I've honestly considered playing that type of, of format again. My, my biggest issue was I was being commissioner of the league and I was running the league. Well, after that's a certain the thing about the, and it, it just burned me out. Dude. It seems, it, it seems so complex. That's why oh, I God, you were spreadsheets and all kinds of shit. I mean, you it's know, it's nuts. Like, I, I run a league that is just minor leagues and we have, you know, $5 inflation and stuff. Right. And it's like, I mean, I, it's like, just the process of like inputting all the salaries for the year takes like 45 minutes because you know there's all these players that are getting changed around so it's it's just a lot of guys you know and yeah it, we were running 40 man full 40 man rosters and like 15 man minor league rosters like all kinds of crazy and, shit and, dude. And, so, yeah. and that's the, the, the reason why the country kind of is like from what I saw and like I said it was only one year like I bought in with a I bought into a team and a friend of mine bought another team. And it seemed like nobody really understood how it was how it was played, except for this one guy. And that guy won the year we played. I think I came in third. And when I looked at like the history, he had like won five in the last six years. And it's, yeah. like, it's like, well, when, right, when, so if you can position yourself properly with prospects, the the, the the biggest thing I can tell you about dynasty leagues is you need you need to stack tons and tons of commodities, no matter whether those are picks, uh, prospects, whether you think they're going to be good or not. Um, because you think about it, look at a guy like Pete Alonzo. Before the season, he was being traded as a you know a top fifty prospect. He wasn't the inner circle top ten or anything crazy like that. This year, you know, if you were to go back to the beginning of the season and redraft prospects, he, there's no way he can't be the number one or number two prospect off the board in any draft league behind Vladimir Guerrero Jr. You can even argue he could go ahead of Eloy at this point, uh, or maybe even ahead of both those guys just based on the success he's had. Do you really? Think um, so? I mean, so I, you, I, I, you can go. You can get lucky and hit just by having commodity. And so you turn that commodity, you, you have you have so much commodity, you just stack and stack and stack and you know, through the draft and trading away all your players. And then at a certain point when you can get you can sign a guy through free agency or you can make a trade where you feel you got a cornerstone guy to, to build around, then you start trading all the commodities off and then start stacking players and building for now. And I'm telling you it's the it's the number one way to win a dynasty league because you can literally acquire so much wealth and then by the time you trade all the wealth off, you can stack you can put together a super team. Now mind you, you may only be able to put it together for a year or two and have a really short window to win but you can be so dominant in that period by doing that it's a really good strategy to work with 
Uh, the, the, the thing that I, I have is like, the question is, was that guy winning this thing because he was a better fantasy player? Or was he winning this thing because, you know, whatever it was, you know, nine out of He's 12. the most active person. A lot of no, times no, the it's not about the, the most active I'm saying, was it, was, it, was it because nine out of 12 teams had no idea what they were doing? You know, and, 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 and that was the maybe, part. That maybe, was the part man, like, he was taking advantage of everybody. Well, I, as I was saying, it's like that's that's not what I would consider a healthy league to be in. And that's why I decided I didn't really want to do it. It's like, this is so... It's like a standard dynasty. It's like, I think I could put together... I think I could pretty well, based on my knowledge and, of, of the world and the people in the fantasy business and people who ask me questions, if I could put together 10 good guys, I could put together 15 good guys at a standard thing. But this system, and I'm pretty bright, like, I was having trouble getting it. Now, admittedly, you know, had I been in three years, I probably would have got it. You know, I probably would have got it as well as that guy did. But I have this, like, thing where it's like, I don't join leagues where the purpose is just to prop up this one guy. You know, like you, you see in nice leagues where, like, four or five teams turn over every year. It's like, well, these three teams have super teams, and they always want you to join in for a year so that they can continue to win. And it's like It just felt like it was more complex than it needs to be. I... I, I, tr- I, I, you know, we had this, we had this argument in that uh, one show we did where we argued the thing that we talked about, like, should you reward the guy for being on all the time? And he said, I go, I understand rewarding a guy for being per- participating, but I think participating, like, if a guy signs in twice a day and does something, that's enough. You know, the, the person having to do much more than that, it's like, that's too much, actually. So, like, I, I, I try to design my leagues to be as streamlined as possible. Like, this should be, you know, one of the reasons I like weekly I like weekly waiver pickups is because, you know, teams don't change radically throughout the week. But the truth is, it's just one process that you decide what your team is going through. So a person could, have, if they were having a bad week in real life, they could literally sign in on, on Saturday, do all their moves change their lineup for every day of the week and then go on, you know, go on vacation or, you know, put in those, you know, six double shifts they need to do and come back and not be worse for wear. At some point, there's too much, you know, like, and, and, it, and that contract just felt like it was too much to me. And not so much that I couldn't understand it or I couldn't get a hold on it, but I couldn't believe that I could be in a, a, a league where 12 people went as enough to, to be competitive. You know, as a commissioner of the league, <clears throat> I think one of my duties is to ma- is to maintain, you know, competitiveness and parity. You know, uh, you know, I, I, you know. I had a situation in this league just recently where a couple guys were, were were proving to be hard to get a hold of. You know, and it turned out like like one guy um, got robbed and, and his computer was was stolen. Right, so he was trying to do everything from his phone and he wasn't any good at it. So it wasn't really like responding to trade offers and stuff. Yeah, that's a real thing, but at least, you know, like, my job is to get a hold of him and then let people know, hey, this guy's got a special circumstance. You know, uh, I think another guy is leaving the league entirely. Um, you know, another guy is just, like, he had made his moves because he's in rebuild mode and he was just sort of, like, putting this one on the back burner. But, like, your job is to make sure that, that no one forgets too much, you know? You know, it's like you you shouldn't you shouldn't change their lineup for them, but you know you're the you, the, the the guy is like, you know I think that you know the commissioner's guy is like, hey, we haven't heard from you in, th- you know, three weeks, and I mean I know you're setting your lineup and that's good enough, but is everything okay? You know, just keep Doug, them involved. To go back to your to, to your previous topic, weekly leagues. If there is any one thing that I could change in fantasy baseball, it's weekly fucking leagues because I cannot stomach them. Well, no, they're, they're, I feel like know. baseball changes so quickly, and especially with free agencies, and especially if you're trying to stream it all, uh, it just it, it limits what you can do so much. And but like I said, what I like is let's, say, let's say for example, lineups lock on Sunday, and Monday I get on and see oh Joe Schmo's tearing it up this weekend. I'm going to pick him up, and and then you can't start into the following Sunday. So by the time you put him in your lineup the following Sunday, that whole next week he goes over seventeen, and there's nothing you can do about it. It just it, it kind of stinks. That's the one. That's the one big complaint I have about it. I, I I like this. I like the kind of hybrid. I like weekly waivers, but daily lineups. You know, I, I think that I th- I don't think that a person. I, I I'm in a league where where it's it's a free for all on the stuff, and the team that's in first place has made 388 moves, and he's in first place because 
I'm playing with 30 guys and he's playing with 100 guys because he's on there nonstop. Now, he's a fantasy baseball writer, 